be a show talk, okay? Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Um, maybe some people are in the evening as well. So welcome to my workshop. Um, what I'm going to do for you today is a, uh, a Turner's mallet. Um, so if I go that one, um, you know, to make a, a Turner's mallet. It's a project that I do on my starter courses. I get um, my students to make one of these. Really useful tool to have around the workshop. Um, that, but it's a fairly straightforward project using um, only a couple of tools, sort of three tools. Um, this piece is out of beach. I'm going to be using a piece of cherry. Um, you can use you can use wet or dry wood. Um, they're good fun to do them wet. You get lots of lovely streamers, and they go oval. You can see that one's gone slightly oval, as long as it hasn't got the heart in it or the um, the pith. Uh, if you cut the, the lump so it's got a uh, it hasn't got a heart in it uh, they won't split they should just go oval um, if you do use the heart like there's one here we we did they will they do tend to split so not a major problem but um, you yeah, know it's nice to have something that isn't hasn't got a, a split in it but that you can see because that's got the pith in it it has split so so that's the project um, I know there are um, a lot of varying abilities out there. Some of you may be turning, have been turning for lots and lots of years. Um, others are just starting out. So hopefully um, everybody will pick something up out of this. And um, yeah, just enjoy it. Um, I'm just gonna have, a, have fun um, showing you this, showing, my, showing you my techniques and um, how, I hold, how I hold stuff. Um, Big thing for me is, is safety um, with um, work holding. My crusade is to get people to use chucks properly. We're not gonna be using chucks today. It's just gonna be between centers. So um, what I wanna do is show you a selection of different centers that are available and what I use and what I prefer. So let's there. So I've got here, lump of wood, but also, a selection of different types of, of tail centers and drive centers. Uh, we all get them in some sort of, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I've got to take that one out of there. So the traditional would be four prong drive, um, which you'd use your mallet for. Um, one one purpose or reason for using a mallet. Um, they have to be driven in to the wood. Um, nothing wrong with that. It's a very secure way of, of fixing. Um, the more, um, so that's a four prong. Two prong drive I do use um, mainly for cross grain. So if I put that between the fingers, is that better? You can see that's a two prong drive. Um, this I use for using in cross grain. Uh, if I'm doing a cross grain form or a a, um, a bowl, I'll put this in aligned to the grain um, so that it's um, running parallel to the straws, rather rather than two of the the um, teeth trying to chop the straws up. Um, the more modern ways of driving things are. Step centers, um, this is a multi-tooth piece, or multi-tooth ring with a spring-loaded center, quite a stiff spring. Um, I use these quite a lot. Um, that's a bigger one. I use the inch and seven eight because they're available in um, a small one, 10 mil, I think, um, three eighths, th seven eighths, and uh, inch and eighth. Um, I use this one for driving quite large pieces, sort of 150, six, six, eight inch diameter, foot deep um, with that to drive, um, quite like those. The other method, the method I use when I'm teaching is a friction drive. Um, now this is a ring center or sometimes known as a cup center. Um, and I, the, the point is adjustable. So I need a longer Allen key to poke that through. So this, this is a, um, 
a robust one made by robust tools. Um, and the beauty of this is that the profile of it matches, uh, it matches the, the tailstock. Um, so they are identical and you'll see why that's important as we go through the project. Oh, you okay? Yeah, you Sorry, it was, you all right, Chris? Sorry. That's all right, mate. Not a problem. What was it? What's Bamber up to? Oh, he's gone. Okay. Oh. I just mute him again. Right. Okay. Um, so that's that's means of driving work. Um, I I like these because they're a, a safe a safe um, method of driving. When I'm teaching, if a student has a catch or a, or a um, pushes the tool too hard, you can set the pressure with the tailstock so that the piece stops revolving. Um, a really good, um, I find it really useful when I'm teaching. So um, that's the drives. Um, obviously we're talking about spindle work here, so we're not gonna be using a, a faceplate unless you're doing your large uh, hollow forms and stuff. But that's more when you, you're holding it. This is just driving it to create your shapes. Tail centers, most lathes, um, the manufacturers supply them with cone centers, um, the, which is an engineering, that's actually an engineering center. Um, this came with a, a lathe, and this is one made by Axminster. That's a 90 degree point, so the, that point is actually describes a 90 degrees. Let's just get that right around. Is that in focus? Yeah. It's well, these are still degree points. Just a little bit lower with those, please. We're going a little bit out of focus. That's better. When we're good. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the 90 degree. That's a 60 degree point and another um, engineering 60 degree point. Um, my issue with these is that if you think of wood as a big bundle of straws um, and the, um, so that's this, this wire brush we think of that as the end of a piece of wood. With a cone center, it just disappears into the end of the straws and also has no lateral support. So if you have a catch, a design change, whatever you want to call it, that is just going to skid through those, those fibers. It's also pushing, the, the, the point is disappearing into the wood rather than pushing it onto the, um, the drive. So my favorite, uh, tail center is is um, the cup center or ring center, ring tail center. Um, that as you push up to it, it, you can see it just doesn't go anywhere. It stops um, when those fibers go into that ring. They're actually kind of, if you cut that in half down there, you'd see a W shape or a, a more than a W shape. So the harder you press, the more it, it gathers the fibers together. And the harder you push on the tail stock, the more friction it creates and the more drive you get. Um, so this, these are a very, very safe way of, of driving wood. And the only, the only time I use a cone center is if I'm doing something with a pre-drilled hole, either a, um, either a pen or a tool handle or something like that. Um, and I haven't made pens for a good few years and I don't make tool handles anymore. So you know how often I use a cone center. Um, not very often. So that's what I'm gonna use is the, um, this, is, these are, this is a robust, obviously robust lathe with the drive center and the tail center, which you can't see in the picture at the moment. Right, let me clear this lot away. There'll be a lot of this information about the equipment you use on your website, Phil, I take it? Say again, Pat. A lot of information about the tools and machinery you're using on your website? Um, no, not at the moment. Um, Contact you for details for... This, this, this is, yeah. Um, I mean, they're pretty self-explanatory. They're easily available. But um, you're just trying to make more work for me, aren't you? I know. Um, the... Um, what was I going to say? I forgot, lost my thread there. Um, what was what did you say, Pat? It was just basically about the lathe and things that you're using. If people wanted information to contact you, 
Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so do, using in this project, I'm going to use three tools. Um, a roughing gouge, skew, and a parting tool. Now, they come in various different shapes, sizes, um, types. So this, a standard, let's start with a parting tool. A standard parting tool, this is my, I've had this for, well, I don't know, it's a Sorby one. I've had it for probably 35 years. Um, it's uh, eighth thickness. Um, I really like it for when I'm doing my caddy spoons. Uh, I can hold it single-handedly and use it as a, a diameter finding tool. So if I'm using a pair of um, outside calipers, I can hold that on there and with one hand create the diameter I want. So that's a, a favorite of mine. Um, another style is a diamond parting tool. So the diamond section is the, the thicker part there probably doesn't pick up very well there, but it's thicker in the middle of the tool. The idea is that you, you don't have to create a gap. It's only going to ride on the, the high, biggest diameter or thicker, thickest bit. Um, I always cut, do two cuts if I'm, if I'm doing any cutting very deep in there. Um, for, the, for cleaning the ends of things, um, I prefer a... Um, these some of these called um, brain fade. Um, fluid parting tool. Yeah, that's the one. A fluid parting tool. Thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, fluid parting tool. These um, I really like because the points scribe, so they're actually chopping the ends of those straws up or chopping the straws up before you peel them off. Whereas with a standard parting tool, all you're doing is just lifting the straws up and bending them over. The slight, the downside with these is that because they are high speed steel, if you, um, you've got a, an ordinary uh, or a standard um, mild steel tool rest, they can nick the rest. Um, this is a, uh, I've got a hardened rod on it, so it's not really a problem with these. If you do use them on a mild steel rest, you have to keep filing the rest to get rid of the nicks. Otherwise, when you come to use a skew, it's not going to slide along. But they're, um, they're really great for what I'll show you a bit later on. Um, the other, so roughing gouges, I've got three here. Um, a three quarter, I don't know who which manufacturer that is. It's um, a tool I've had for a long, long time. You can see it's got my own handle on it. Uh, Henry Taylor, um, and they all have, and then a Sorby, and they all have different flute shapes. Uh, although the small one and the larger one uh, have a similar similar flute shape. I'm gonna use the, uh, the Henry Taylor. Um, it's just, I love this one for when I'm doing my spoons because I can get into smaller places. But for what we're going to do here, that um, Henry Taylor one is going to be ample. So that's the tools that I'm going to be using. So that one, that one, and then a skew. Um, there are lots of different types of skews. Um, oval, round, uh, rolled edge whatever you know people people have their own preferences um when i'm teaching i just use an inch and a quarter or inch and an eighth uh rolled edge skew so that the edges these the corners aren't really um sharp and they just it works nicely on the tool rest so does anybody have any questions at that stage so far, Phil, just the treads on the end of your drive center, if you would just explain why there's treads on the end of it, please. Okay. Um, these, because they're American, that one won't come off. Um, they, are, they are a three-quarter ten center. Um, three-quarter ten thread, sorry. Um, and there's various things that you can put on. Uh, I wouldn't, well, I probably would, might use this if I was driving... Uh, remounting a change your camera please sorry yeah remounting a um 
uh, it's their hollow form or something on there. They've got a, a three quarter ten nut in the back. These are from the States, they're from a um, company called Rubber Chucky. But I've got some, um, some nuts that I've got sourced here that I could make my own up. I just haven't got around to doing them yet. Um, this, these will fit on head or tail stock. Um, and they're really useful. Some um, one ways come with aluminium cones. Um, so you can either invert it or um, have it as a, an outside cone. So that's what the thread's for. Next question. That's it, Phil. You're good to go so far. Everything is clear and concise. Crack okay. On. All right. So the um, what I'm going to use is a chunk of cherry. Um, this is I very rarely buy um, dimension timber. Most of the tim wood I get is is green. And um, so I just cut it up with an electric chainsaw or chainsaw, <coughs> electric chainsaw in the workshop, petrol outside. So um, various different ways of finding centers. You can use a, a center finder um, or just trouble with, with irregular wood like this. I've got to go around there four times to try and find the center. Whereas with a bit of experience, you can just sort of eyeball it. So that's that end. Um, I just popped that up between centers earlier um, and got it pretty close. Um, to what I do is mark the center. My favorite tool is this little engineering punch, which just with some pressure creates a little divot in there. So it's a spring loaded, spring -loaded punch. You gotta put a fair bit of pressure on it to make it work. That's a favorite, but you could also just use a braddle um, just to, to make a, um, a divot in the end there. Pop that back over there. They, you can get these from um, any engineering stores or you know online now. I suppose is the favourite place to get them. They are adjustable. You can adjust which one that bit to get so you haven't got to press quite as hard. So I actually used got a sheet of uh, a thin um, tin and put a series of, of marks in it. So I've got a base point and then varying different ones coming out in line that are match up to the diameters of the jaws that I want, the different jaws I've got. So I can just set the calipers to when have the one leg in the base point and then when it drops into the, the one I want, I know I've got exactly the right setting on my dividers. And that was how I did that. Just a little throw that one in. The little divots are great for um, just locating the points. So I can actually feel that going in there. So I can wobble it into that there. So with a little bit less um, pressure on the tailstock, that's still captured between those points but and spinning freely. And then with a bit more pressure on the tailstock, that now is, is um, driven. So I know when I set these, this up like this, I have the, the two points, two of the points horizontal. So when I put, set the tool rest up, I know that that's going to be, uh, we're going to, should miss, but that's, it's just touching there. So I can just back that off a little bit. Drop the tool rest down a little bit. When you're using the roughing tool, uh, spindle roughing gouge, make sure you're not going to fall off the end of the tool rest. Um, this torus is just long enough to do this, but I'm going to work from this direction. Um, well, I'll show you two, two methods actually of, of roughing down. So that's all clear. Turn the volume down or the speed down. Wind it up. 
yeah, this is a, a um, variable speed lathe. Um, a lot of people ask what, what speed you run at. Um, once I've got this, this is probably um, 600 RPM at the moment, something like that. Now, I'd normally be wearing a visor, but with the camera mounted here, I, my head, um, my head touches it, or the face mask touches it. So that's um, that's why I, you know, I'm going to wear one now, and also the, for for talking, but mainly because I'll I keep, I'll do that, and that will be really annoying. So with a roughing gouge, there the tail stop. So you can see I'm just touching there and then lifting into the cut. So I can either peel it down that way. And you can see that was slowing down. So I put a bit more pressure on the tailstock. So this, you can use that method or do the reversing cut. Now all the time I'm doing this, I'm watching the profile over here so I can see how much is coming off. I'm going to move the tool rest in uh, so I'm not having to reach quite as far over. You can increase the speed a bit more now. So you can see where that, where that slowed down then. Um, if when I'm teaching, it's really useful because you you know that the student is cutting too hard if you've got to keep um, tightening the tail stock up. So it's a you know, it's a good um, aid when you when you're teaching, and it teaches them more about tool control and how to approach how to approach uh, how the tool approaches the wood. Now, just checking whether that's round, I'm using, having my thumb trailing, not pushing my finger into it. So it's just it's a, a safe way of just checking without having to switch the lathe off and on again. I can also feel that I've got that, that round. A little um, something I show my students is when you move the tool rest in, you need to lift it up again. Uh, let's go to this way. So if I push that tool rest in now, you'll see that the tool drops down. Um, so then, so it's changing the bevel angle there. If you've got the angle at the same, you you develop muscle memory. And um, when you go back in, if you've dropped this, if you haven't moved the tool rest up. Um, that cuts differently. So lift the tool rest up a little bit, and then you're back to where you were before. Okay, so that's round coffee cup full of um, shavings. Okay, now I'm going to use the the fluted parting tool just to clean the ends up and give us a little bit of space so that um, as I come around with, with the, the skew, I don't cut into the, um, the tail stock. So what's going to be best here, probably overhead. Let's just move that camera around so you can see a bit better there. How's that? Yep, it's good. That's good, Phil. So with this, I need to have the torus a little bit higher because I'm going to prescribe an arcing cut. So the tool is going to be down here and then go that arc like that. I'm not going to try and push it straight in because I want to peel these fibers. So it's going to start with the handle really low and then come over and just peel those down. This isn't terribly square. 
So a bit of pressure into the rest. Because I'm arcing the cut, you getting nice shavings coming off. When I'm teaching, I usually get my students to do three widths of the tool here. Just allows a little bit of space, a little bit of leeway. And that's cut that nice and cleanly. Um, very little tear out in there. If I was going to use an ordinary um, chisel type parting tool, it would be a lot more furry there. Okay, so I move up to the other end. Move the camera around. Sorry if I'm waving that around at you. Do the same the other end. usually down to about three quarters of an inch diameter there. Okay, so I'm just going to move that back there again. How's that? Yep, yeah, good. So now um, I'm going to mark this out, what's going to be the head and what's going to be the handle. So the, the this, this piece of wood was obviously a bit longer um, when I made this one. So what I'm going to do is just make the head a bit shorter. So it's about uh, two-fifths, three-fifths, the uh, proportion between the head and the, uh, the handle. So if I mark there, and then I'm going to use the skew to mark out where the... the um, the head's going to be. Now this has got a slight radius on it. Uh, well, you can see there that the points, the long and short point, are slightly drawn back. Just the tiny radius on there just makes it a bit easier for, um, or reduces the chance of getting a catch. I say reduces, it doesn't, doesn't stop you getting a catch, um, but it just reduces it because when you're, you're doing a planing cut, those points are a little bit further away from the work. So I'm just going to do uh, I can see that mark, just put a V cut there and then come in here. I'm not a great exponent of a skew, um, but this it's a, a good tool to teach people. If, people. if students can understand how a skew works, I find all the other tools fall in line behind it. So that's a skew, so lose the that. Um, so now I'm going to reduce the diameter here of the handle um, and that's to suit your own, your own um, hand size. I've got pretty big hands so I will have a fairly um, bit larger diameter than, uh, than most people will. So at that stage, has anybody got any questions? Uh, somebody wants to know, Phil, if to soften the corners on their tools, like parting tools, will it protect their tool rest? Yes, a lot. Of, some tools um, come out of the factory with very sharp edges on them because they are straight off the surface grinders, um, and they will. They're difficult to slide along the rest and will mark in the rests. Um, so yeah, just with a, a diamond file. Um, or a uh, slip stone or something, just run over the edges of them. I've got my favorite diamond file there um, that's always to hand. And if this was a standard, um, a standard tool, um, I'd just run it along the edges. This is double-sided. It's actually a, a knife sharpener, this one. Um, you can probably hear the difference in that. So that's just, yeah, you know, just run that along the edges just to take those sharp corners off. 
Anything else? Uh, just uh, size of the timber, Phil, that you're using, and also timber fir mallets that you recommend. Um, this is a piece of cherry. It was uh, just under four inches, sort of three and a half inch square. Um, any any uh, relatively relatively hard wood you can use. Um, as I say, they're good fun doing matter wet wood because they actually go oval, and then you've got a a nice oval handle. Um, I mean, in this country, mallets traditionally made, were made out of beech, um, but for just knocking around the workshop, fruit woods are good. I used, the first one I had was or made was out of apple wood, um, but you could do you know oak, elm, ash. Uh, there's no real hard and fast rule, I don't think, for making a mallet. It's only um, just for knocking around the workshop, unless you're making one for, as a um, meat tenderizer um, that you would want to use ash or beech or beech really, um, because they have, uh, timber has a um, um, butcher's blocks. They have an anti, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the reason butcher's blocks are made out of beech is that they don't, um, bacteria can't grow in it. There's antifungal, I think, in the, in, the, in the wood itself. So, yeah. But just, you know, whatever you've got. The one thing I would say, and I said earlier, was not to use a branch um, because it will, it will split if it's green. Um, so if you, if you can, cut it so that it's away from the pith and then you'll get a um, you know, nice oval mallet. But wood, um, yeah, I can't say what you use in the States, but um, just anything really. I mean, poplar wouldn't be very good, but uh, any reasonably dense hardwood. Okay, Phil, um, I think this question means would that file that you've used smooth your tool rest? No, it's not um, coarse enough for that. You'd use a, a machinist file to do that. Um, this is, that's just for, um, uh, I use that for sharpening my hollowing tools. Um, and it's, so yeah, but it's, so it's not coarse enough to do your tool rest. You could polish it with it, but not for removing a lot of material. Okay, uh, David Buskell kindly put up a link to your book there for anyone interested. Uh, lots of suggestions there from people about different types of timber for the mallets, but I think you've answered all that anyway, so you're good cool. to go again. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to reduce, we need to take quite a lot of wood off here. Um, so I'm just going to reduce that and I'm just going to do this in steps. So I'm up the speed again. Change. So I'm about halfway up the scale. So this is probably doing um, about um, 1500 RPM, I think it's, I set on the high ratio, which is from 30 to 3000 RPM. So I'm doing it at 1500 RPM. Nice sharp gouge. Take your time. You can get some really nice shavings coming off. Doesn't really pick up on there. The diameter I want here is around sort of 40 mil. Trying to hurry it, it's, so it's telling me I'm trying to hurry it, hurry it up. I'm going to, I'm being too aggressive with the tool. That's when it stops. This, this sort of doing this is is good fun because you've I've got a nice pile of of shavings. Let's see if I can just move that there. I've got a lovely pile of ribbons just down there by my feet. Um, that I personally, it's, it's fun to try and get ribbons coming off. Nice sharp tool um, and getting a really good finish straight off the tool. Um, but it's just fun um, just to, to, to make shavings. And to do that, you're just progressing the tool at the same, same rate all the way down there. Just to get that, those lovely ribbons. When I um, used to 
teach in Germany, I learned sort of salient phrases, and one of them was, every cut is a practice cut. Um, I'm not going to try and say it in German, because when, when I do, everybody, everybody criticizes it. But um, it's, it's true. It's, you know, every cut should be a practice cut, so that you're, you're applying the same amount of, of, of pressure to the tool. So you're getting those nice, even shavings coming off. And that way you're, you're actually in control of the tool. You know, it's telling you you've got control of the tool. And with a nice fine wood like, like um, cherry, um, you get some, some great shavings. These um, friction drives don't work well when you've got end sealed wood. Um, because end seal is, is, is basically a wax. Um, so these friction drives don't work in that, in that case. So here where I've got the, coming up against the head here, I'm being a little bit careful about how I approach that. I'm not going to come in on this wing because you'll get a, a catch. Uh, just using this face here to rub the bevel against to try and get down in there. So I'm going to reduce this a little bit more here. Just tighten this tail stop up again. Probably a few more revs. So I'm creating the shape in steps. So all I've got to do is just a smoothing cut to get the, the handle, the shape of the handle in there. Now, if you don't want to use a skew, if, you, if you're not familiar with using a skew, you could leave the head that shape or under the head that shape and just do that um, but I prefer to put a little bit of decoration in there so now I'm just creating a nice curve in the handle putting a taper on it so that it's just doesn't drop out of your hand uh, and just feels more comfortable. It's going to fit your hand better. Let one more cut. So I can use the wing of the gouge like I would a skew and get a really good, so that's coming off about a third of the way down that face and just getting a really nice finish off the tool. Get that bit off there. So that's pretty much the handle done. Um, I prefer, as I said earlier, to have a V cut in here. So I'm going to go back to the skew, which is here, and just come back up the head. And this is just one half of a V cut. Just using the point. to arc down there. Just nice and slowly, just clean that so you've got a really nice clean, clean face in there. So at this stage, uh, I can, no, I'll, I'll clean that up in there. So I'm just going to put a little bit of a curve on there. So it's just rolling the tool over. Now you don't want to go too small in there because if you go too small a diameter in there, you think that it's going to be um, too fragile or you know, not very strong. Um, so about you know, just over an inch. That's what I, I prescribe anyway. Um, I can 
with the gouge. Take it, make that a little bit shorter in there. We'll just take that out there. And when you do this, just check, just check. I'm not sure where I'm, why I'm getting a bit of vibration there, but I am. Just check that it feels right. Yeah, you see I've got pretty big hands, but that fits pretty much perfectly there. So now I'm gonna put a taper on the head. Um, now why do you put a taper on the head? Um, if, it's, if it's parallel, they don't, it just doesn't feel right when, you, when you're hitting something. Um, and if you look at, say, a, an upholsterer's mallet, the ends, they're a, a, a block head, but the ends are always slightly tapered. Um, so let's just put a bit of a taper on here. Um, I can use either the roughing gouge or the skew, but I get my students to use a skew. Um, what I've done is just angled the tool rest at the angle I want the, um, of the taper that I want on the, on the head. So I'm going to work from left to right. Rub the heel, chest, with the cut in the middle of the tool, I'm looking at the, at the horizon, getting some really nice ribbons coming off here. You'll, you'll always get a really good finish with a skew. We're not doing anything spectacular with this, just using it to make V cuts and planing cuts. But because I've got the tool rest at the angle that I want to have on the head, I'm not really having to do a lot with the tool. And it's just really satisfying to get a, a mountain of ribbons like that, and that's, that could probably be one shaving all the way down there. One ribbon. Okay, so I've got that little bit of a curve there, so it's a little bit more off down there. Now I have no idea why I'm getting vibration on this. I don't think it's the skew because it was happening in here as well. Perhaps too much tension on the, the um, tailstock. So that's pretty much the shape we want. Um, but what I want to do is put a little bit of decoration on it. So it's got a you know, nice taper there. Feels good in here. Um, so what I'm going to do is where I've put a curve in here, I'm going to do the same, this end with the skew. Uh, and just nick that corner off first. And as I do the next cut, I'm just going to ease the tool around a little bit. Let's go to the tail stop and see if that's... Is that a better view, Pat? Yep, sorry, that's good for that, Phil. So just putting a little bit of a dome on here. And again, it's a, it's a good little exercise in tool control. Take your time, just bring the handle around and do a few little V cuts down there. We're not going to go anywhere near parting off yet, so I've still got half an inch of timber there. While I'm here, I'm just going to put a little, couple of little V cuts in there, just as a bit of decoration, and use a, a, uh, a hot wire. Always do two, never three. Two, you can, um, two, you can always get the same distance apart. But if you put three lines, you're going to really struggle to get them equidistant. So 
So that feels feels good, and it's you know it's not going to the taper on here. It's not going to fly out your hand. So to put some decoration on there, it's just a a little a wire. This is actually um, a strand of a bicycle brake cable. Um, so we're there. We're good there. So all I'm going to do is just in those locate it in the groove and just wrap it round. I'm not pulling very tight. <laughs> That works. It just gives you a little bit of, of decoration. You can, if you want to get fancy, do a bit more decoration on there. Um, with, uh, and this is a technique shown to me by the hat man, Johannes Mickelson. Mike Wilson, whatever you want to pronounce his name. And these are thin strips of uh, veneers. In this case, this piece is a bit of uh, rosewood. I'm not sure which one, but it's a rosewood. And what I'm doing is sharpening the ends on a bit of um, 80 grit abronet um, to a knife edge. Now, if you want to make some filler, you can do that, gather the dust up, and you, you mix it with your um, aerodite or super glue or whatever to make fillers. I don't, but you can. This is a piece of bloodwood. Uh, so you can see this is very red. And then finally, piece of ebony. And they're just sort of two mil thick, or what's the equivalent of two mil thick in Imperial? Three sixteenth. Nod your head, Kate, if that's right. 316th? No, it's not. I can just see. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that's a knife, nice knife edge. So I can get the tool rest up nice and close in there. Um, and what I'll do is start with the, the um, bloodwood. So I want fairly high RPM on this now. And as you push it against it, it burns in color. So that was the bloodwood. This is rosewood. You can really personalize your. Anybody home? And then to differentiate them, use the or differentiate put um, delineate. Just use the ebony to create a really black line. Just a bit of fun. A little bit something a little bit different. You don't need necessarily need to do both. The the um, burn the hot wire um, and that, but um, that's pretty cool. It kind of looks like a an S wing um, leather handle um, and gives it um, yeah really personalizes it. Um, I don't sand these. I don't um, personally I don't sand them because I'm, I'm only going to use them knocking around in the workshop. I've got I can see about six here. There's three behind me. There's two over there and another one over there. Um, every time I do a course, I have to I make one to show the students. Um, and sometimes they want to sand and polish them and take them home. If you wanted to, uh, and then use a um, uh, a hard wax oil finish um, so that if they are dented the, the finish isn't going to come off. I don't put a hard finish on them like a, a lacquer or waxes or stuff like that, just a, a um, coat of, of a hard wax oil. If you wanted to make it into a meat tenderizer um, you could put a series of, of V cuts in here 
um, to beat your stakes with. So that's would and that's that's Dave Buskell. That's one of my the projects in my book, and I used um, boxwood then. Um, okay, what I'm going to do now? How are we doing for time, Pat? Uh, that's down to you, Phil. As long as it takes. How long have I been going? Nearly an hour. It's now you're about the hour mark, nearly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things, Phil. People are just asking about the wire that you would suggest to use for burning, um, and you can cover all this in the one, the obvious one about safety regarding news and things like that at the lathe, and types of wire. People recommending guitar strings and things. I think you can cover all this. In. Um, okay. The the um, the reason I use uh, bicycle brake cable is that many years ago I used to be in the bike trade and have still got some, some bike, um, some brake cables hanging around. And I just unspiraled one strand off it. Um, I talked to somebody the other day and they use um, wire from, uh, copper wire out of your electrical cables. Um, what they hardwire the house with, not your, your, the flexible stuff, what they hardwire the house with, that works well. Um, it's a fair bit thicker I quite like to have a fairly fine line, um, but um, yeah, it needs to be of a thickness that will heat up fairly readily. Um, I think you know something like fencing wire uh, would be a little bit too thick and take uh, too long to heat up and, and wouldn't really work. But yeah, uh, I'm not good with gauges, but um, the bike brake cable is pretty thin and the, the um, Electrical wire uh, is a bit thicker, so it's going to give you a, a, a thicker um, band. Um, as to the safety of it, I'm not actually wrapping my hand around it. I'm just pulling it round. Uh, let's go back to the overhead. I'm just, um, as I said, I'm just wrapping that round. Uh, let's go tailstock shot so you can see how much. It's the, it's the length of the, all the wire between the handles is engaged in the wood or touching the wood. Um, and that's what's causing the friction, not putting a huge amount of pressure on. Uh, it's just wrapping it around it. Um, this, this piece has got, you know, shorter and shorter. Uh, and I'm gonna have to take another piece off that bike brake cable to do it. Um, does that cover that? Yeah, that's it, Phil. I think the rest of the safety involving glasses or shields is kind of a, a given anyway. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I explain why I'm I'm not wearing one because if I keep if I keep touching that with the my uh, face shield, it's going to get you know people are going to be seasick. Um, okay, at this stage, I'm pretty much done. Um, what I do do though is just nick this corner off, this top corner, just one cut there or two just to clean that edge up you can do the same down here if you want this is where you can you know really personalize them now coming to to parting it off um, I'm going to use the point of the skew to get this as clean as I can I'm just peeling that away down there Gonna go down to about an eighth in here. And where I said earlier that these ends match, because I would struggle to get down here, this end, um, I'm gonna reverse it. So it's a lot easier to do. Because one of the reasons, um, or what I do with these is put, make a concave head. So that that's slightly concave so that it stands on its end rather than takes up less space on the bench, but also you, know, you drop it on the tilt, they'll roll around. So if you've got a nice little concave head there, they just stand up. So because this, they, these match perfectly, I can, they are this, exactly the same profile. Um, I can, that's running perfectly true. So now I'm just going to move that camera again. Excuse me for a second. 
there so you can see what I'm doing. And I might go for a zoom. There we go. So get down in here. And now I'm going to gradually come up this face. Two or three cuts. Again, that's good where these friction drives, so these friction drives are good. If a student has a catch here, it's just going to stop. So last cut. Down there, and I haven't taken a huge amount out, but you should be able to see there's a nice gap in there. Let me get something a bit strong. Let me get a rule so you can see a bit better. So there's a there's a a, uh, a gap in there. So I've got a concave head, and now it's just a case of reducing this again. I'm not going to go right through. Just go down fairly small. And I could do a little bit the other end. Take a little bit more off. Get that the end as clean as possible. So now take it out. Now you could just Do mash it, that. Uh, yeah, let's just go. Sorry, I forgot to to move that back again, didn't I? Too much to think about. Um, what you could do is just mash that down on the tool rest. I'm oh, sorry, the the lathe bed, just to to crush those fibres there. Um, but I haven't got very much, so I can either just slice it off with a, um, I've got a flush cut saw here, Veritas, not specifically for just doing this, but something I've had for years, um, which is great for this little job. So it's just taking that off there. Um, and now I can clean it up with a little um, carving tool and just pare that away, use my thumb as a fulcrum, so my, these fingers are nowhere near the, um, the cutting edge. And the same the other end. Just arcing the tool into the cut. one personalized mallet. So that's, yeah, done. Well done, Phil. Anybody, um, anybody got any questions? Um, there's, you've covered most of the questions. Uh, lots of comments about their shorts and um, safety, you know, that you're not wearing jewelry and things. People are complimenting you on that. Um, you've, people in from all over the world, as I said to you, South Africa, Australia, everywhere. Um, oh. So, yeah, you've topped our bill at 116 viewers. Um, so lots 80, I can see there's 81 comments in the chat. Yeah. Uh, most of them are bad. I didn't read those ones. Okay. <laughs> no, lots of compliments, Phil. Well done. So if people are